Mm. Okay, well, I can't believe it's October already, but here we go with another season of Curious Minds Talks, and it's lovely to see everybody here. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, but we have a very good programme this year, and if you didn't see the programme leaflets on your way in, feel free to pick one up on the way out there on the little table. Um, our first talk tonight is Professor Bill Austin from St Andrews University, who's going to talk about blue carbon, but Bill will enlighten us. He's one of our foremost UK experts on this. However, before he starts, I have to remember to do the health and safety stuff. Okay, we have no fire alarms planned that I know of anyway. Um, if anything, do if an alarm does go off, you can use that fire exit or the door at the back that you came in, do not use that one because it just goes into the booth. So if you just go out the door that we came in, that's the easiest thing. And then we muster in the left-hand car park as you go out. I think that's all I need to say about health and safety. David nods, <laughs> that's fine. Um, so I think everybody's in now, got a seat. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Bill Austin. Well, thanks very much, Claire. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm uh, honoured to be invited. And um, I've looked at the programme and delighted to see so many colleagues from St Andrews uh, coming to contribute. So um, let's, let's hope it goes well this evening. Um, if you do want to reach me, you can reach me um, at the uh, University of St Andrews. You'll find me on their website. And I'm very happy to take any questions by email as well, if you're too shy to ask at the end. Uh, so by all means, uh, email me. Um, I think your norm is to ask questions and have a discussion at the end. But if there's a burning issue that's wrong, <laughs> Uh, by all means, interrupt. Um, but I think if we take the discussion at the end, that might be easier for everybody. Um, so lovely to see so many of you out on a Friday evening as well. So thank you for coming. Um, yeah, so my presentation is blue carbon. It's a term we do here. It's a term that you may have heard recently in the debate, a quite controversial debate, about Scotland's highly protected marine areas and a change of policy direction there. And in that context, uh, blue carbon uh, was um, designated as one of the criteria for protection of our marine habitats here in Scotland. I lead the Scottish Government's Blue Carbon Forum, and uh, I provide evidence in this space to ministers. So of course I was disappointed um, at the outcome, but of course, uh, there's an issue there about communities and the way that the evidence and the science come together. And that might be something that you would like to discuss at the end. And I'm sort of reflecting on the news yesterday evening about these extreme temperatures um, that are being recorded at the present time. So I'm also going to partly intersect with climate policy here. And there is an opportunity. So I'm, I'm presenting something I hope that's hopeful. Um, and it's an opportunity to think about uh, nature and the restoration of nature. So there is a strong agenda, uh, I admit, uh, for conservation in terms of some of what I'm going to uh, speak to. Um, my first slide is a slide I'm very proud of because we worked with a group of artists in Scotland uh, for COP26. This is the venue in Glasgow. The UK hosted COP26 in Glasgow in 2021, not in 2020, uh, as, as the slide suggests. And of course, it was delayed by a year because of the pandemic. And that was a fantastic uh, opportunity, really, to engage with a wider public audience. And uh, obviously, part of this evening is an opportunity um, to communicate some of the science we do and to communicate these ideas around blue carbon. Uh, and I've realised in this consultation on the HPMAs that that's something we hadn't done very well. And, uh, you know, this is a, clearly an important aspect of science. And so I'm pleased to be here for that reason as well. 
The other thing I'd like to say is that in 2021, uh, we brought together at Scotland's uh, National Academy in Edinburgh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, world experts to discuss blue carbon during uh, the COP26 climate conference. And um, as a result of that, I now lead a UN programme in this space. And one of the things that you begin to realise is the extraordinary lack of capacity in some parts of the world to actually implement some of the science and the opportunities that I'm going to highlight to you this evening. So I think part of my academic journey is also towards um, realising the need to build capacity in other parts of the world. And this is something that we're doing at the moment uh, through the University of St Andrews, trying to build these international linkages in this space. Um, let's jump to this slide. So there are some really important aspects of uh, what I'm going to say this evening, but probably the single most important thing to say to you, as hopeful as my message may be, is that these nature-based solutions that I'm going to talk to you about, these blue carbon ecosystems, are a very small part of the climate problem that we face. And uh, we briefed uh, UK Cabinet Office, I'm not sure they read it, but you know, they certainly got the briefing from us as a, a network of academics in the UK on these nature-based solutions. And one of the high-level principles that I think is key here to remind ourselves of is that this is not a silver bullet. We fundamentally, all of us, have a challenge ahead in terms of decarbonizing our economy, and that we need to do this um, rather swiftly with deep emission cuts. So whilst nature-based solutions and blue carbon will pro provide an opportunity, it's not going to solve uh, the climate problem. And uh, sometimes we need to communicate that to our uh, politicians, who of course are looking uh, for you know, perhaps a slightly easier way out of some of these problems. I, I don't think that applies here in, in Scotland, but um, you know, in some parts of the world this is being seen as the way to deal with the climate problem, and, and that's not the case. Um, the other thing is this very nice uh, schematic. No, we're, we're lovely. I think he wants it for the filming. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's this schematic from Pete Smith at the University of Aberdeen, a good friend and collaborator, who really emphasizes in this concept diagram the idea that biodiversity, as part of a nature-based solution, is going to work through our Earth system to develop and deliver sustainable uh, development outcomes. And the UN program that I lead is actually tied in to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So the idea here is that by restoring nature, we're actually uh, helping to achieve uh, some of the goals uh, that the UN has set. Okay, so uh, what is blue carbon? Um, it's a term that's often used. Uh, it's a term that, um, in its strict sense, refers to coastal vegetated ecosystems. So these are marine habitats. And the example I've, I've shown here is a salt marsh uh, from the head of Loch Fyne in Argyll, um, showing in the foreground uh, this vegetation. Now, these ecosystems also include seagrass meadows, and in the tropics, they include mangrove forests, which are very widely distributed. In terms of Earth's uh, habitats, these are some of the most threatened, and in terms of loss of these habitats, we've lost more of these habitats than many other habitats on the planet. And that, of course, is because these are nice, convenient places uh, for society to develop, um, infrastructure, agriculture, and so on. So um, much of this land, for example, has been historically reclaimed and turned into agricultural land. And of course, with rising sea levels, I'll present this in a moment, um, this presents an opportunity to rethink uh, the use of that reclaimed land. 
Um, in terms of the Earth's carbon cycle, about 83% of our carbon cycle, which of course is part of the greenhouse gas story that drives global warming, involves the ocean. And these habitats cover a relatively small area, about 2%, and yet their sediments hold about 50% of the primary produced uh, carbon. So in terms of area and amount of carbon, you get a lot of bang for your buck um, in these systems. So as places where we might manage the natural environment to deliver additional carbon gains, these would be very good places to be uh, focused on. The reason for that is that they're highly productive um, and the waterlogged conditions of the soils mean that the organic matter is very readily preserved there. So we've got very uh, large um, soil carbon stores beneath these habitats. The analogy is probably uh, our peatlands here in Scotland. So if you know about our peatlands and the drive to restore our peatlands, actually quite a similar sort of argument that we could make for these habitats. Um, the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's an acronym you might see quite regularly. And they've highlighted uh, that to achieve net zero, this ambition of reduced emissions to meet what's been called uh, the objectives of the Paris Agreement, which is to limit global warming. We're not doing very well at the moment, I'm afraid. We're, we're, uh, on target to overshoot on the, on the Paris Agreement, um, means that we need to reduce emissions. And as I've said, a lot of that can be delivered through the way that we consume energy, uh, maybe through improvements to agricultural systems and so on and so forth, transport of course, but also through these nature-based solutions. And as we get closer and closer to our net zero target, of course, some of those emissions are going to be very difficult to remove. We need agriculture, and that will create some emission. We have to accept that, and we need to have, therefore, these carbon dioxide removal or CDR techniques. So nature-based solutions like blue carbon fall into that category. And the good news, or the encouraging news, is that if we start this sooner, the process is cumulative, so we're actually building up over time a larger and larger carbon store in these systems. Um, another way of doing this, of course, would be to plant forests and uh, their sequestering and, and then storing carbon as well. And the oceans are a good place to do this. We've got large parts of our planetary surface covered in the oceans. And, uh, you know, they're a very effective place for the chemistry of the carbon cycle uh, for us to sequester this carbon. Okay, so that's, I think, setting some of the context. Um, blue carbon, uh, you may not know, but does sit in existing climate frameworks. So there is an opportunity here for our governments, and in terms of our greenhouse gas emission accounting, that would be done at the level of the UK government, but I'll say a bit more about how this is done in Scotland in a moment. Um, and we have these frameworks that allow these ecosystems exchanging carbon dioxide with the atmosphere uh, to be implemented into frameworks where a country through something called its uh, Nationally Determined Contribution, the NDC, uh, can bring forward a proposal to include these habitats in the NDC. So our peatlands are part of the UK NDC. Unfortunately, our peatland, peatlands, because of their state, are still emitting greenhouse gases at the present time. But of course we know from the science that by improving the conditions of our peatlands, they will become uh, carbon sinks. And the other important thing about peatlands, like blue carbon ecosystems, is that if they're degraded, that big store of carbon is releasing greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. So it's exacerbating the problem. So poor management 
means that we're adding to the global warming problem. So this is a good incentive you know, to restore nature already in this argument. And the, the point here is that we have a framework, policies have been developed and implemented towards the adoption of these blue carbon uh, ecosystems into our greenhouse gas inventories. Now, I mentioned CDR, it used to be called geoengineering. And uh, the idea here, of course, is that we've got a whole host of opportunities to uh, implement carbon dioxide removal. And we could imagine a range of technologies. For example, if we have um, a power station emitting uh, CO2, we could capture that CO2 at source, pump it uh, perhaps into an old oil or gas field, and store that CO2. And, you know, that would be a, an example of CDR. So that's certainly being explored, and there are uh, test sites already in the, in the North Sea doing that. However, if you think about the net cost, so this is a report from the US uh, National Academies, the net cost to remove a ton of CO2 can be pretty high. And the other point, of course, if we're going to implement these sorts of uh, technologies, we want to make sure that the CO2 doesn't, you know, a year later find its way back into the atmosphere. So we talk about the permanence. So the additional CO2 that we're going to trap needs to be held somewhere to give us this permanence. And um, I've been told I, I need to stay by the microphone or won't hear me. Uh, but I'm using the laser pointer now, and on the left-hand side, we've got something here called ecosystem recovery. And what we see at the moment is that the net cost per tonne is relatively low, but the permanence looks pretty good. And the really attractive feature here is that the environmental risk of simply restoring nature is, of course, low. This is a good thing to do. And, you know, it's relatively inexpensive uh, compared to some of these other technologies. And I've explained to you that there's a year-on-year -year, uh, storage of carbon in these systems being built up. So this is certainly something that we need uh, to be encouraging governments to do. And uh, I think uh, when we look forward to COP28, which is the climate conference that will take place uh, later next month and into December. It's taking place in, in Dubai, is the presidency, in the United Arab Emirates. Um, they, I think, are going to have a push towards some of these blue carbon ecosystems, so mangrove forests in particular. So watch out for the news in about a month's time. Uh, I think, you know, the idea of a mangrove cop may be emerging. And of course we need a, maybe a salt marsh equivalent here in Scotland. We have seagrasses of course, um, but our understanding of seagrass distribution in Scotland is, is less complete, obviously, because they, many of these habitats are subtidal and, and not as well mapped. Okay, so, um, you know, to give you some sense that this is possible at scale and will deliver positive outcomes, I think many of us, um, you know, might know something about uh, the deforestation of the Mekong Delta. And whatever the history and the politics of this, you know, this is, I think, something to recognise as a very positive restoration of nature. So in the photograph here in 1972, and then in 1997, we see the above ground biomass, so the plants themselves, um, doing pretty well. And of course in these systems, these are mangrove uh, forests, uh, these systems are producing leaf litter every year, and that's being incorporated into the soils, and in these very waterlogged conditions, that's adding to the carbon store of the soils. 
Um, I believe there's something quite similar going on in uh, modern agricultural practices and in increasingly the implementation of regenerative farming, uh, these no-drill techniques where the soil organic matter is being built up, uh, you know, as, as something that's beneficial. And, uh, you know, this is not uh, such a, a different idea, really. Um, and we do have some evidence, so there is data, uh, people have been studying these systems to demonstrate the additional carbon that comes from the restoration of these forests. So we know we can do this, uh, this is an extreme case, but you know, we know we can do this and we can demonstrate the additionality of carbon. Now I wanted to draw a little just on my own experiences of work here in Scotland. And uh, Scotland started uh, working on blue carbon relatively early, so you know I think we should all be very uh, proud of this and um, some pioneering work uh, from SNH, now of course known as Nature Scott, uh, early work to assess blue carbon resources in these inshore marine protected areas. Uh, so this was I think one of the first of its kind to try and make an assessment of simply the amount of carbon that was being stored in these marine protected areas. And of course, uh, those marine protected areas have and are largely designated for their um, the flora and fauna, so the sort of biodiversity characteristics that help uh, create the designation. And so you begin to realise that there's a, a move here to bring this climate dimension from the carbon stored together with the biodiversity. And this is a, a very exciting time in the UN conventions on climate and biodiversity, which are really starting to come together now. And people are realizing that if we can protect biodiversity in nature, we're also going to deliver some climate benefits in that process. And, uh, you know, of course, we've lost a lot of biodiversity, even uh, within my relatively short lifespan. You know, we've seen great loss in biodiversity uh, here at home. The other thing uh, that I think, uh, you know, we could be uh, pleased about in terms of uh, Scottish Government climate change plans, uh, you know, the challenges are immense. I think we all understand this, but we've certainly seen in 2018 the adoption of the blue carbon concept into climate change planning. And I think this signaled a very positive mood, uh, move that uh, nature and these ecosystems um, were providing a climate benefit. As hard as it is to quantify those climate benefits, I would acknowledge that. And uh, in the lead up to COP26, uh, the UK uh, publishes the overall UK NDC, this is the nationally determined contribution, uh, but Scotland uh, published its indicative NDC for Scotland. And this also included uh, reference to um, commitments to blue carbon and their integration into our nationally determined contributions. So again, ahead of the curve a little um, in terms of the UK as a whole. And then uh, maybe it's slightly more controversial, I don't know what your politics are, don't ask me about mine. Um, but you know, in 2022, we saw the Butte House Agreement, and that, that was a power sharing agreement between the Green Party and the government, the SNP government, that really brought, I think, greater uh, interest and attention to nature and biodiversity. And in fact, in that process, the commitment to blue carbon and these HPMAs, these highly protected marine areas, was, was made. And of course, I mentioned at the start that some of that policy has changed, but the commitment is still there. And that's the important thing. We just need to find a different way to deliver on improved management of these resources. So that's, you know, I think we should still be pleased that that's there. 
Uh, and of course, I think what you recognize in this process is perhaps the idea of natural capital, or if you like, the blue carbon wealth of nations, as one paper put it. And Scotland, of course, is blessed with a large share of the UK natural resource. So it's completely understandable that there would be an interest in accounting for and uh, working with uh, these opportunities in and around nature. And uh, as I mentioned at the start, I chair a forum uh, which is supported uh, by the Scottish Government. It's called the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum. And we provide evidence uh, in this process. And we also, uh, through a UK-wide forum, provide a view from Scotland into the emerging policy interest in this sphere. OK. Uh, now, a little bit more technical, but I'll go through this reasonably quickly. I don't want to overburden you. Some of these slides you'll appreciate you know, taken from other bits uh, that I, I sometimes teach as well. Um, so this is stuff that I'm probably covering with students. But I, I just thought this concept of additionality and permanence would be of interest to you. Um, if any of you read The Guardian, um, you'll have noticed recently that there's been some rather controversial press coverage of a forestation projects uh, in a voluntary carbon market. Uh, and the idea here is that you can trade this additional carbon on a voluntary carbon market. So a company, let's say in the US, has emissions, you know, it wants to promote itself with a net zero agenda to its customers or, you know, to its shareholders, and it will trade in a voluntary carbon market to the scale that it could potentially offset those emissions. Now, you know, we can debate probably for a long time whether that's a good thing to do or not, but it does create a financing mechanism, of course, for nature restoration. And, you know, that would be seen probably as something that governments and public money are not going to be able to fund at scale. And so we do need uh, this interest from uh, private investment. That's understood increasingly, I think, in uh, this space. The challenge, of course, is that if you're getting this wrong, that you're claiming uh, more additionality than you're actually delivering, or that the permanence, the store of that carbon is not there in 20 or 50 years' time, then you've obviously missold uh, these uh, credits and uh, this is the problem at the moment. Some of this science is still at a stage where we're learning as we do some of these restoration projects. And it does mean that um, the scale of our confidence, if you like, or the uncertainty in this additionality that we're delivering can be uncertain. And this is, I think, true for blue carbon. And those funded finance projects are just starting to come on stream uh, mostly in and around uh, the tropics for mangrove forest restoration. And there's a great deal of interest, as you can imagine, in this space. It's been estimated that there's a trillion US dollar market in this voluntary carbon trading. Um, so we need to be careful, and I think this is where science and the evidence, you know, can test some of these ideas. And, you know, we're trained, I suppose, as scientists to be healthy sceptics, and uh, you know, that has to be part of our role. Even if you know, the conservation agenda is something that we're sold on and passionate about, uh, the evidence is, is key, because if we get this wrong, we're actually, in the longer run, longer run going to undermine everything that we're trying to achieve. Okay, and um, I don't need to say a huge amount about this, other than you know, this can be done, but it is quite difficult to do. And at the moment, there are very few people who are able to do this well. And the folks who do it well have set up consultancies and charge large amounts of money to verify the carbon credits. And that means 
that some of these smaller schemes that you might want to implement are actually very expensive uh, to get off the ground. And this reminds me, therefore, that for these restoration programs, purely focusing on the, the carbon is probably not enough to secure the financing that they require. And this is where the idea of valuing nature comes in. The idea that nature perhaps has an intrinsic value or that nature itself provides some adaptation to climate change. So mangrove forests, for example, in recent tsunami events have been shown to protect coastal infrastructure. And that, you know, in itself has a value. And the problem is we don't fully value nature. And uh, I think this is a fundamental challenge for the way that we do business, you know, we need to increasingly value nature and of course at the moment we can value carbon in these uh, trading schemes but we don't have all the tools to value everything that these ecosystems provide. So we sometimes call these ecosystem services and you could think of a whole range of, of services uh, that nature is providing. And in some ways, um, I reflect on European exit, the Brexit process. Um, we've come out of the uh, common agricultural policy that, for example, uh, pe made payments uh, to agriculture. And that creates an opportunity to rethink the way that uh, agricultural payments uh, might be made through subsidies that would create better outcomes for nature. And this is, this is very much <coughs> current thinking. It's going through UK governments in something called ELMS. And I think here in Scotland, we're just uh, still working through that process. Okay. Um, and I just did say something about these uh, verified carbon standards. So of course, you know, if you're investing a lot of money you want some uh, verification and understanding of the risk. So, as I said, the, the methodology is complex. Um, we are and uh, have been in the UK uh, with colleagues across the UK working uh, on a domestic, what's called a salt marsh code. So we know that our salt marsh habitats are probably the best option for um, incorporation into these sorts of carbon schemes, either for greenhouse gas emission accounting or for a voluntary carbon market. And what we've been doing is, is uh, developing a code whereby uh, we could begin to uh, value uh, the benefits from the restoration or the reclamation uh, processes for these habitats. And this is quite exciting to do at a national scale because it provides a framework in which those other benefits that I was talking about can be integrated. And so you could create in this framework a series of stacked benefits. And if we could stack all of those benefits and, and create um, realistic values for nature, it would be much easier to implement these schemes because it would draw in more financing um, to make them possible. Uh, here in Scotland, uh, in my group, uh, we've been looking at carbon accumulation and storage across uh, the salt marshes of Scotland. And um, whilst you know, these are slow-growing systems, they're not taking in huge amounts of carbon. We do now know that they store a very significant amount of carbon. We've done some uh, dating, it's called radiocarbon dating, often used in archaeology to date human remains. So we know that some of these deposits are thousands of years old. So this is carbon that's built up over long periods of time. And probably the most important thing we could do is, is to protect these habitats to ensure that that carbon stays in these waterlogged soils because otherwise if those soils are drained perhaps for some marginal agricultural gain the oxygen gets into uh, the organic matter and that's then released as carbon dioxide so we know there are some very simple things we could do at the scale of Scotland that would deliver some benefits for the long-term 
protection of these habitats. I should acknowledge that many of these uh, sites are protected across Scotland as uh, sites of special scientific interest as well. And uh, recently, during the pandemic, um, sort of sitting at home wondering what to do, they wouldn't let us back into work or it wasn't, you know, safe or appropriate at, at times to get back to work. And um, one of the things that we did do was uh, a citizen science uh, project. Um, and in my garage at home, I saw the tips of uh, a very large number of uh, plastic syringes, the pointy bit where the needle goes, and left the plungers, and that creates a mini cora. These were posted out to volunteer groups all across the UK, um, nature reserves, um, groups such as yourselves, I'm sure, and we were able to then uh, get those posted back to the lab, and when we were able to, we then went and made the carbon measurements. We had a volumetric sample, we had an app, so they could take a picture of the ground where the sample was collected from. We did find some of them were 10 miles inland, and we had to reject those, I'm not quite sure what was going on there. So there's some quality control issues with citizen science projects. But we've recently published uh, this, and it's the first complete uh, carbon stock of these habitats, you know, with full uncertainty estimates. Um, and we started that work actually with a national uh, stock assessment here in, in Scotland, which was, um, I think, the first time that had ever been done. Okay, so um, there are lots of uh, factors, of course, if you think about how carbon gets into these blue carbon systems. We've got biological, chemical, physical variables. There are lots of variables at play uh, when we're trying to understand how these systems work. Uh, so they're highly variable. Uh, we see very large ranges in the amount of carbon that's taken up. Um, so that means that perhaps one place is much better than another to implement these types of projects. And um, I suppose to come very clean, the point to make here is that the range of uh, offsetting potential, uh, for example here calculated for 2020 as CO2 emissions, from these global blue carbon ecosystems ranges from a very small fraction of, of a percentage to about 6 to 7 percent. So um, most people would take an optimistic 3 percent. So globally we think that these systems, these blue carbon systems, can offset about 3 percent of global emissions. Now for some countries <coughs> that have large, extensive mangrove forests, Indonesia, for example, this now becomes a very significant contribution to their national emission offsetting. And more significantly, um, a huge opportunity for the financial markets to develop restoration projects in some of these countries. So whilst you know, the global number is relatively small, it's still making a contribution, and for some countries, blue carbon uh, opportunities are going to be quite significant. Um, just really quickly, I mentioned at the start that the blue carbon term is used sometimes in quite a broad sense, and we have actually used it in quite a broad sense in Scotland to refer to all carbon in the marine environment. Strictly, as I said, it, it's a re reference to mangroves, tidal marshes and seagrasses. And there is an emerging interest in blue carbon ecosystems, um, wild macroalgae, kelp. And we're seeing a growing interest in the licensing of uh, seaweed farms. And one of the claims that's been made here, which you know has some validity, is that this is also a way of sequestering and taking in carbon, in addition to you know the aquaculture process of growing these seaweeds, uh, and that's attracting a huge amount of interest at the moment. 
And it, it's an area of science that's moving very, very quickly. There are as well what we call non-actionable blue carbon ecosystems. Coral reefs, you know, very important in the tropics, under a lot of pressure from ocean acidification, for example, and other pollutants. It would be nice to be able to include those. But when you form calcium carbonate in those skeletons, you're actually releasing CO2. So for that reason, they're not included. And the other one that's drawn a lot of interest, of course, is uh, the fauna in our seas. So if we had more whales in the sea, there would be more carbon in, in those. They'd be cycling carbon. And we would be, as somebody put it recently, recarbonizing the ocean. Unfortunately, you know, the policy frameworks to account for all of that don't exist at the moment. So they're probably, at the moment, going to remain as non-actionable uh, systems. That doesn't mean we don't want to restore um, you know, these parts of the, of the marine life. It's just that for carbon, they're probably not going to work. It's often a question I'm asked. Um, here in Scotland, uh, we've done some work up at uh, Nick Bay. This is up in the Cromarty Firth, and it's an RSPB managed realignment site. Scotland's first managed realignment, and, uh, originally a tidal marsh. It was reclaimed for agricultural purposes. The seawall was uh, not doing very well, and the RSPB were very interested in uh, building some or creating some new habitat for wading birds. And uh, this site actually has a stratigraphy. So this is a golf hole cutter. Of course, from St Andrews, we'd have to carry golf hole cutters with us out in the fields. Um, but it produces a very nice sequence. And you can see there the vegetation at the present day salt marsh. So this is a salt marsh that's been recreated by flooding. Um, derelict agricultural land. And what we see in this stratigraphy from the bottom, so older down here and then getting younger to the top, is a build-up of organic carbon in the soil. And we've in the lab, we measure this as, as just a percentage content of total organic carbon. And you can see in these uh, cores that we've collected that generally, with some wiggles and noise, that they're all showing this increase in carbon in the soil. So, you know, this is a nice illustration of additionality. Now, of course, uh, there might be some emissions uh, from this uh, habitat, and we, we haven't accounted for those over this 20-year period, but we do have a carbon store that's built up here that wasn't there before. You know, and that's, I think, very encouraging. And the very good news for the RSPB was when they implemented this scheme, um, well, nearly 20 years ago now, it was for uh, habitat creation, for biodiversity reasons. So this is great news. You know, they've got extra carbon, they've got this blue carbon dimension to their project that's adding uh, potentially to the value of, of what's been done here. And the RSPB are actually important landowners across the UK and abroad and are, are very interested in uh, the idea of this additionality as a way of helping to fund the schemes. So of course you can imagine that some of this low-lying agricultural land is quite productive and therefore quite valuable and the cost of buying land is, is high but they do need to purchase the land before they can begin, of course, the managed realignment scheme itself. How am I doing for time? Because I, I tend to just go on. Okay, keep going. Good. <coughs> All right, so, um, yes, I, I think um, this is a nice example to share with you uh, from the east coast of Scotland, a place called Tyningham. And at Tyningham, there's a, a marsh represented here by the uh, coloured areas on this uh, satellite image. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you see this very curved and then straight line. This is uh, where historically this land had been reclaimed from the sea. But the land uh, here 
and it is very productive agricultural land. Um, and we haven't spoken to the landowners about the implications of this, so uh, keep quiet. Know, I'll keep quiet. <laughs> um, I, think, I think we're going online, so yeah, but please email me. Um, and, and the point here is that if we were to breach these sea defences, we know from the elevation of this land, and we use um, remote sensing, what's called LIDAR data, it gives us a very detailed um, model of the land surface. We know that a large area here would actually flood and would naturally uh, create salt marsh. So this is quite an exciting thought experiment for us. And uh, uh, climate exchange commissioned this work for Scottish Government and the question was uh, with rising sea levels what are the opportunities to think about managed realignment of our coastlines around Scotland and of course if we create a managed realignment that counts as a management action and therefore the extra carbon is additional so you know you could start trading this carbon if you were so minded um, so that was the report, if anybody wants to read it. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, just showing you now the current area in orange, and uh, that's the total, then we subdivide these marshes into a high marsh and a low to mid marsh. They're naturally zoned, because they're in the intertidal frame, of course, and the plant species have different tolerances to inundation. And then the modelled area in green here, is the extra extent of habitat simply by letting the sea back in onto this low-lying land. And a historical map here, 1894 to 1915, <laughs> showing us that this land has been reclaimed, you know, well over 100 uh, years in this part of the east coast of Scotland. And we know that historically, large areas of uh, low-lying land like this uh, were restored across Northwest Europe. And we've probably lost, it's been estimated, about 50% of this important uh, coastal wetland habitat in historic time. Okay, so um, what we then do is think about the future of sea level rise. Now on the right-hand side here, uh, this diagram uh, on the... Um, uh, bottom axis here goes to the end of the century okay and what we're doing here is uh, showing projections of what future sea level might look like now we haven't made these up they're actually partly based on the idea that if we emit more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere that creates a bigger uh, warming effect and that greater warming effect will increase the rate of sea level change. And you can simulate these things in climate models. And so uh, what you do is you use uh, something called the RCP. This is the representative concentration pathway. So what we really want to do is follow a low concentration pathway by reducing emissions. Uh, but there's a range of scenarios here. So it's helpful to think about, well, if we if we emitted a lot of greenhouse gas, what would happen to sea level rise? And the answer is, of course, in this solid red, that by the end of the century, we'd have a, a great deal of sea level rise at the coastline, at this place, to deal with. So we really would like to follow that solid blue line. Or if, if, if you live near the coast, you would. Um, and so what, you know, what we've done here then is taken these different scenarios and taken time slices and said, well, how might the distribution of this habitat look in 2032? That's kind of on our way to net zero. 2045, so that's the Scottish Government commitment to net zero. 2070 and then the end of the century. This is a very simple model. It's not a dynamic model that's saying, you know, it'll move inland further and further. We've just let it flood the land, and we're not thinking about erosion or loss of habitat as sea levels rise. But we do see very different uh, responses. And what I've done is summarise these on this next panel 
to emphasize why managed realignment might be quite a helpful thing to us. These are important habitats, these coastal wetlands, for wading birds. They support uh, quite specialized uh, nature. And uh, the area, in all of these cases, here's the gray line showing the current marsh extent. And if we do the managed realignment today, it takes us up to this much larger area. So that would be good in terms of having more of this habitat at this one place. Now, of course, we start to lose that habitat because of sea level rise uh, if we don't let the coast, uh, coastline migrate inland. And we lose less of it by the end of the century if we have low emissions. And we lose a lot more of it by the end of the century if we have these very high, sometimes called business as usual, emission scenarios and, and this has probably changed or, already uh, by the time since the time this diagram was made. Good news though is that in all of these scenarios apart from the worst case of continued emissions we would still by the end of the century have more of this habitat area than we do at the present day. And of course, over that time period, this larger area of habitat would have been building up an additional store of carbon. So, you know, this shows us that there are things that we can do to deal with rising sea levels, but it involves rethinking that concept of holding the line with our coastline. And we are going to have to accept that in some places, there may be opportunities to let the sea in. Now, of course, um, for communities, this can be extremely worrying. And, um, you know, our, our sort of process of doing this is, is not well developed in our planning system. And there are some challenges, I think, to do this well. But it, it does show us that we're probably going to have to do more of this in the future. It won't be appropriate everywhere. You know, there's infrastructure and roads and cities that we will need to uh, increasingly uh, pay the cost of protecting. And those costs are going to go up and up and up. So as Lord Stern, in his review of climate, the economics of climate change, showed us over a decade ago, it's cheaper to deal with these problems now than it is to leave them to future generations. So I've almost finished. I've got two more slides. I'm going to just uh, finish with some key points. So uh, class, these are the things to take home. Um, so blue carbon ecosystems, including these mangrove forests, tidal marshes, and seagrass meadows, are gaining international recognition as natural climate solutions. And they can definitely contribute to climate change mitigation. So the mitigation is the sort of offsetting of, of, of the effect of global warming. But they can also help us meet these adaptation targets. And I think we're all increasingly realising that the window to mitigate climate change is closing very quickly. And that, you know, we're going to have to accept that we're going to have to do more and more adaptation uh, to these uh, extremes of climate change. Uh, global distribution is large and they can potentially store very large amounts of carbon. But the important point I think to keep emphasizing here is all the co-benefits they provide. You know, it's not just about the carbon. That would be too reductionist to think this is just about the carbon and the money I can make from this project. So lots of other benefits. And protecting these ex uh, blue carbon uh, ecosystems, the existing ones, could avoid very large emissions to the atmosphere. So this is, I, I would say, a no-brainer. You know, we need to protect the carbon that's in these ecosystems. And if nothing else, this science has shown us that there are very large stores of carbon in these places. So protecting them is important. And blue carbon's potential as a nature-based solution, of course, depends on societal actions. And if we want to restore these ecosystems, 
this will contribute to some of the um, UN decade objectives for nature restoration. So there are these targets and we could contribute to these here in Scotland, in the UK or through overseas uh, projects. And then finally, these emerging blue carbon markets probably do need to aim to incorporate the value of these co-benefits, but how we value these is challenging. And if we can do this and bring them into the financial frameworks to assist in the investments required for restoration and conservation, we're on the right track. So I'll end uh, with a picture. And um, in 2019, when we first started this work, this is um, primary age school children from Montrose. Uh, this is Mary Goujon if anybody recognises her, then Minister, now Cabinet Secretary, good friend to Blue Carbon in Scotland, and uh, myself. And what we were doing here was, uh, you know, as part of the outreach work of the university, um, getting these students to realise, understand the benefits of, of the habitats on their doorstep, but also to collect, these are the little mini coras, very cheap to make, and uh, they've actually got a dot on the map now. So they're very, very proud of that. So to build up the stock map of the UK, uh, this has been the citizen science type approach that we've used. But there are lots of benefits, I think, to engaging uh, this very young audience uh, in, in some of this science and, and their understanding of it. And then on the left-hand side, um, as part of this UN program, we're doing more and more work from the university now. This is Alex Houston, who's a PhD student, measuring uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, these are colleagues uh, from India, from Ahmedabad University. We're doing field work here and learning ourselves about mangrove forest restoration in the state of Gujarat in uh, Western India. So, you know, there's a lot we can do and I think it's partly about building capacity now in, in other parts of the world as well. But there's lots to do here in Scotland. So on that note, I'll stop and take any questions you have. That's fine. So, uh, yeah, thank you. And agree. Um, two, two questions and a bit of an observation. So, uh, you, you demonstrated potentially some controlled flooding or, or even some uncontrolled flooding just with rising sea levels in that particular location in, in Scotland. Now that, now that Scotland, for example, through the Crown Estate, uh, has access to um, effectively benefit of, of the foreshore, it, 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 I'm always conscious that, that we seem to, as, as a public, subsidise oil companies and to an extent subsidise landowners to sometimes do practices that are very much against the natural capital of, of the planet. Is there an opportunity with, with, shall we say, direct action to speed up that reclamation process uh, in, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, 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 reclaiming that area? Controversial, but uh, I don't necessarily need to express an opinion. But uh, I can give you an example if that would help. Uh, the okay. second, the second one is there are five ocean uh, gyres which are becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, is there not an opportunity to, to really look at how we could expand those and, and essentially create almost like an artificial mechanism to sequester carbon in what I would call a, a, a neutral area, but could actually capture at scale? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I'll, I'll deal with the first one uh, first, if I may. And um, there's a very nice uh, nature restoration scheme funded through government, but now being increasingly subsidised uh, through private enterprise. And that's called, it's, um, I think it's administered through Nature Scott. It's called SMEEF. It stands for the Scottish Marine 
Environment Enhancement Fund. And I understand that, you know, that's a voluntary scheme, but uh, that's, if I've understood correctly, some of the um, licensing of offshore renewables, at least, has provided an income stream that's partly supporting the Na Nature Restoration Fund. And, you know, I think that's a very positive uh, use of that income stream. And SMEF has an interest in coastal restoration projects, and they are supporting community <coughs> projects, uh, as I understand, around Scotland. Um, there have been some good examples of seagrass, uh, community-based seagrass projects. Um, for the second point, um, yes, there is. Uh, I have colleagues in the US who probably already earn quite a lot more than we do here in Scotland as academics, who are leaving acad academia um, to create startups in this space. And that's because, you know, there's this huge interest in financing this CDR, this carbon dioxide removal. So the example you've given is quite a good one of where there's a push at the moment to um, essentially cultivate giant kelp. And one of the suggestions is that this very highly productive um, plant in the ocean could then be sunk to depth and uh, create a sink from the atmosphere. So if you keep doing that, you're essentially creating a biological pump from the surface ocean into the interior. Now we know eventually, you know, the ocean's going to recirculate and, and then naturally release some of that stored carbon, um, usually in regions of upwelling. But that time scale is probably at least a thousand years in some parts of the system. So that would create an opportunity. I think the danger uh, is um, and this is, is what worries me most, is that you're manipulating a natural ecosystem in ways that are going to probably impact the balance within that ecosystem. <laughs> but you could turn around to me and say, well, aren't we doing that already? Um, and I think that would be a fair point to make. So uh, EU are funding through um, EU funding schemes. Uh, work in this space. The Americans are doing a lot of work. Uh, there are private startup companies exploring this. And uh, the People's Republic of China are massively into these sorts of schemes. So I think inevitable that we will see some of these things coming. But the costs, as I showed in that diagram, you know, the costs are high and the, maybe the environmental risk is not understood. Uh, yes, please. Is the capture itself mainly photosynthesis? Yes, so um, these are essentially um, systems, coastal vegetated systems that are, you know, primary producers, photosynthesis. But we know in some of our work in Scotland that um, these systems are also trapping sediment that can come from somewhere else. So, you know, if you think about uh, seagrass or a salt marsh, it's a natural baffle when the tide washes in, carrying particles that maybe got carbon or organic matter in them. So we call that allochthonous carbon. And the question is, uh, if that's come from a terrestrial soil that's been eroded and has already been accounted for somewhere else in the system, you know, how do we do the accounting? So there are some technical challenges and actually debates about how to do the accounting. Um, so the verification folks, because they want to be quite conservative, um, actually try to exclude that outside component and only count the primary in situ production. Yeah, good question. It's, it's technically it's a hard one to solve. No, it's just I was wondering as you go deeper in the water, obviously the penetration of yeah, so, yeah, so, so this is why, you know, in, in, in these large gyres, for example, I mean, the problem there is that they're nutrient limited. So you can only, without artificially manipulating nutrients in the surface ocean, you can only get so much.
productivity and, and then you use up all the nutrients and whilst you've got lots of light and potential for photosynthesis, you haven't got enough nutrients to fuel the system. Illuminate the seed bed. Well, people, there, there have been some experiments actually, and iron is an important what's called macronutrient in the oceans, and there have been experiments at reasonably large scale, seen from space, did work to um, seed the surface ocean with these nutrients, and that creates uh, plankton blooms. Um, but most of that gets recycled very, very quickly in the system. Uh, yes, at the front. Yeah, uh, it's maybe related to these, but I was wondering about the provenance of seagrass and kelp. Are there any blogs of them? Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's, that's a good question. We know that seagrass has an associated soil, and in the Mediterranean, where, where there's a different species um, of Posidonia, um, those mats can be very thick and very carbon rich. It's a slightly different situation as you come north and um, the sediments or the soils, as we sometimes call them in Scottish seagrass, holds much less carbon. But they're still very important habitats as nursery grounds for commercially important fish species, for example. And um, you asked me about kelp, and that's a really interesting one, because I sometimes show a picture of kelp to students, and I put a question mark, and I ask them, why is this a questionable blue carbon ecosystem? And in that table I showed you, it's an emerging blue carbon ecosystem. And it has very, very high um, primary, uh, net primary productivity, so it's very, you know, taking in a lot of carbon, but of course it just has a rock hold fast and doesn't then store the carbon in the habitat. So the problem with kelp is that we know it's uh, producing a lot of carbon. We know that a lot of that organic material is broken down at the end of the season and feeds you know, a whole host of ecosystems that are connected. We don't quite understand how much of that carbon gets stored, but some of it almost certainly is being stored in adjacent marine sediments, uh, so that's why it's, it's one of these emerging systems at the moment. Uh, so there's a lot of interest actually in, in trying to understand that. Yes? Okay. You said you, you didn't want to talk about politics, but I've got a question kind of about politics. So in Western Europe and North America anyway, if you know which way your buddy will vote, you can predict uh, their stance to something of blue carbon, for instance. And have you met, is, is that general or is it peculiar to North America and Western Europe? And have you any idea why you've got this strange coupling between political views and very specific technical issues? It seems weird to me. Yeah, I, you know, I, th I think as an academic, the science is very interesting, you know, and there's, globally, there's an interest in this science and in um, improving the science and the evidence base. I, I think a lot of scientists uh, have an interest in nature if you work in this field. And I think there's a growing public understanding of the importance of nature. And... Whilst it's challenging still, and I, I don't want to talk about UK recent domestic policy, which of course is changing, we've seen that. Um, you know, there's a growing understanding of the value of nature. And in fact, the UK government commissioned just over a year ago um, by Sapatha Dasgupta, who's a very eminent uh, economist, a study of the value of biodiversity. And his report is a huge report, but there's a nice short executive summary online, which I, I have read. Um, and he shows very nicely, you know, that um, we are undervaluing nature. So I think our economic systems are, are going to shift. I think we're seeing this in um, agriculture at the moment. And I think the net zero agenda of all our governments, you know, because there's international commitments to be made, whether or not they're kept, is another matter, 
is going to drive a change in policy towards nature. It just makes, you know, that diagram I showed you of the opportunity cost, you know, it just makes so much sense to be looking after nature a little better and restoring nature where we can. Um, you know, why certain governments or political systems, uh, I, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. I'll dodge that bullet. Yes, at the front. A um, couple of questions, if I may. Uh, one is, uh, there was interest a few years ago in Merrill Meds as a sink. You haven't mentioned that, but interested in that. The second one is, um, at the moment, there's a big Scottish government consultation on biodiversity. Yeah. So it's partly plugged to encourage people to respond to that. Um, and part of that is about setting um, in legislation targets for habitat restoration, do you think that's feasible and would it possibly apply to these habitats? I'll answer the mill one first. Um, and in fact the work of the Blue Carbon Forum has included from, I think University of Glasgow had some uh, work on mill beds. They're incredibly important, as you may know, to support um, benthic ecosystems. So this is a calcareous algae. The diff and, and they also uh, have, you know, amongst those calcareous algae, a lot of organic material is accumulating. The difficulty is that mill itself, when it calcifies, is actually releasing CO2. So it, it would strictly despite the fact that, you know, we've had work in Scotland looking at Merle, it would strictly fall outside of these actionable blue carbon ecosystems. However, that doesn't mean that it's not a very high priority um, benthic habitat that you know, very often is protected. And, and there are lots of uh, Scottish MPAs where the Merle is being protected. And we also know that, uh, and this might be controversial uh, to some, but w we also know that bottom trawling, you know, has a very negative impact on some of these ecosystems. And that's obviously been, you know, a very politicised part of the HBMA uh, process. If you come to the biodiversity consultation, I, I got an email today reminding me it was still open. And, uh, you know, we can all contribute to that. I think uh, the idea of uh, setting targets for restoration uh, you know, is a very positive thing. Uh, I suppose the challenge is, with limited resources, you know, where are we going to focus our efforts? And in terms of our evidence work on blue carbon, which is the one thing you know, I'm probably qualified to speak to in that piece, because they're ecosystems, so they, they are connected to the biodiversity that supports them. What we've done is produced, uh, actually at the scale of the entire UK EEZ, the ec Exclusive Economic Zone, so it's all of our shelf seas, but we've uh, done this for Scotland in more detail. We know what we've uh, termed the hotspots. So we know parts of the seabed which uh, support very high densities of carbon. So at the moment, you know, the advice that we could probably give is that uh, these are the richest stores of carbon and are probably, uh, you know, uh, of worth protecting. But because the process of uh, restoration is going to involve lots of decisions around ecosystems, we're going to have to find a way to optimise these decisions. And I think that's that's going to be more challenging um, for our policy makers. I'm not sure that answers your question, but uh, you know, did, did you have an answer in mind? Um, no, I, just, uh, I, I think it's going to be very difficult to set restoration targets. Um, I was just interested in some of the concept of habitats that we're talking about lend themselves to setting targets in that way. Yeah, they do in terms of um, managed realignment. You know, you can pretty be, because it's tidal inundation, and you have probably a very detailed um, elevation ground elevation model. You can set very clear uh, objectives for the area of restoration. 
the progression of restoration, you know, there's, there's, there's a process of what we would call succession, you know, a pioneer, salt marsh plants come in and then it develops over time. So that, that, that would lend itself pretty well to targets and because of the sea level trajectories uh, in that commissioned work, you could say, well, given that sea level might be here by the end of the century, we would like to maintain at least a status quo of the aerial extent of this habitat. So to do that, we will have to allow for a managed realignment of X hex hectares. So that, that's doable. I think what's more worrying uh, for blue carbon at the moment is that you know some governments have set targets for 100 million mangrove trees to be planted. But of course we know that in these restoration projects that not all of those will survive. So it is better, I think, to have um, area targets. Um, so that's, that's probably the advice I would give. You know, set, set an area that you want to restore rather than perhaps a number. Yes? I'm interested in the marine areas of special interest that caused Oh dear. A little bit of controversy recently, um, in that it was said that they hadn't been chosen with due process, that the locals hadn't been consulted, that it was just, say, 10% had to be protected and we'll have that, that. That was the impression given by the publicity. Um, Would you like me to comment? I would. Well, yes. Are there areas being looked at as alternatives? Um, is there sort of consultation with the local fishermen? Compromise being reached? You know, because it is important. Yeah. Well, it's not, so it's not really not already proving how, how fantastic it can be. Yes, yeah, so th this is um, one very small protected area. Uh, near the island of Arran, where um, there are benefits being directly observed from complete protection. Um, let, let me start by saying, you know, that I think uh, our fishing industry is important here in Scotland. It has very important cultural connections for these um, communities. Um, there are parts of Scotland where there are few economic alternatives so I think that's important to recognize at the same time we have to balance that with our commitments as a society to these conventions on climate and nature you know, biodiversity so there are some challenges you know in this process either the status quo or we have a progressive policy uh, that is about protecting and creating a more sustainable future for our oceans. Um, now the process itself that the media picked up on, and um, you know there might be polarized views in that process from you know different lobby interests, if I could put it that way, um, you know does mean that uh, we ought to look at the actual process that government uh, set in motion. And that process was a consultation. So, you know, I, I think there was a consultation in play. No decisions had been made. I think the minister came on television when it was announced that they were changing their plans um, on the HPMAs. That, uh, that you know, she emphasised that the consultation was still underway and that no decisions had been made. But it became you know, very politicised. You might have heard the, the song by Skip Nish about the clearances again, evoking the notion that these policies for the good of the environment uh, were, you know, equivalent to the clearances of uh, yesteryear. And, you know, th those things are very difficult politically uh, to then get traction on. So, I think what the, uh, if I've understood, the consultation hasn't been published yet, but I, I understand it will be published and we'll see what all the views that people had and expressed. That the minister has been very clear 
that the government is still committed to uh, marine protection, but they will do it in a different way. And the challenge, I think, for communities and the worry for communities uh, with the HBMA process was that it was very much a sort of complete ban on all activity. I'm delighted to be thanking Bill Austin for speaking to us this evening. Uh, he's really launched our new series of lectures in, in a wonderful way. But before I go on, I could point out that that could be me. I had a pack of filled <coughs> syringes and I walked out through the mud of the reed beds on Bunkton Island. I've clean forgotten that. <laughs> now I've got a bit of feedback. Yes, we, people have been asking us what we did with all those samples. Okay. <laughs> we, I think, are in danger of compartmentalising it. It's the way we, we put things in boxes so that we can cope uh, with the complexities of life. So we think of biodiversity as one problem, we think of climate change as another problem. But Bill this evening has brought it all together and it's reassuring to think that we might be able to tackle climate change and biodiversity at the same time. It's, they're all interlinked. And yes, we have got the diverse biodiversity crisis and if we can do something about that, that would be wonderful and at the same time tackle climate change. Bill's given us a stimulating talk and taken us below the surface of the oceans. It's something most of us probably don't know very much about. Uh, there's this vast sea that covers the majority of the planet and we know nothing about it. So we've got a glimpse of, of potential there. So thank you very much Bill for making us think this evening about potential with climate change, with biodiversity, and perhaps everything isn't quite so black as maybe his, his opening remarks when he picked up the item from last night that temperatures are creeping, soaring, and going up in a, in a terrible situation. Thank you very much, Bill. Yeah.